Hi folks, following on from the launch of our F20 Professional, we thought now would be the perfect time to show you some of the finer details that feature in the product that you may have otherwise missed or may have misunderstood. We'll start this video with the engines. One of the more common support queries we receive is regarding the engine fans on the front of the engines not being animated. This is actually correct behaviour for a lot of turbojet powered aircraft, as these blades at the front of the engines are not fan blades, they are inlet guide vanes which are stationary blades to use a direct flow of air into the first stage of the compressor. The compressor blades you can see are directly behind the inlet guide vanes and they are animated. Continuing on the engine theme, the inlet guide vanes, engine nose fairing and nose cowling use hot air tap from the 12th stage of the high pressure compressor for anti-icing purposes. There are two places where air is tapped from the engine, hot high pressure air from the 12th stage high pressure compressor and cooler low pressure air from the 7th stage low pressure compressor. The valves for these systems can be controlled on the bleed air supply section of the overhead panel. The anti-icing itself can be controlled via the respective airframe anti-icing and engine anti-icing panels. To briefly explain the level of simulation we have here with the anti-icing systems, you will notice that the state of the airframe and engine anti-icing does affect engine power. At high power settings, you can see and hear a drop of RPM from both engines when the anti-icing systems are switched on. Although there was no minimum engine RPM limitations during descent and holding, in order to provide a sufficient amount of anti-icing, the engines must remain above 75% high pressure RPM. If the engines drop below 75% high pressure RPM, the landing gear warning horn will sound, informing the pilot of their low power set. This horn can be silenced by pressing the undercarriage horn silencer button on the pedestal, or by using the toggle JPWS control assignment. The normal procedure for descent in icing conditions is to keep high pressure RPM above 75% and use the speed brake to vary your vertical speed. This then brings us onto some quirks of the flight control system. One of which is a speed brake blowback feature that varies the position of the speed brake depending on your airspeed. At speeds above 190 knots, the speed brake can only extend enough to provide a constant deceleration of 0.1 g regardless of the speed brake lever position. The three modes of flight control operation are also fully simulated, including full manual control of the elevator, rudder and ailerons, alternate electrical control for the stabiliser trim and flaps, as well as hydraulic accumulator simulation to limit the amount of extension or retraction that can be achieved with the speed brakes, lift dumpers and landing gear. For further information on the flight control system in the F28, we would recommend checking out our dedicated flight control system video where we deep dive into the flight controls in the F-28 and fully explain the three modes of operation. Link in the description box below. Talking about the landing gear, another quirk of the F-28 is the difference between the extension and retraction times of the landing gear. Retraction of the landing gear after takeoff is very quick and the full retraction process takes only 5 seconds due to the full 3000 psi of the utility system powering the system. The extension, however, takes a significantly longer time. From selecting the gear handle down to the main gear doors closing takes approximately 25 seconds. The slowness of the landing gear extension is to prevent any sudden pitch changes that could be caused by a fast extension, and this is achieved by the utility system 
only supplying 500 psi to the landing gear system. If the landing gear has no hydraulic power, then an alternate landing gear extension must be performed. Once the alternate landing gear lever and the aft pedestal is placed in the down position, the landing gear door mechanical uplocks will unlock, opening the landing gear doors, and a dump valve will depressurise the hydraulic pressure lines to all the landing gear, allowing them to be extended via gravity. Once the gear is down and locked, the relevant green lights will illuminate on the instrument panel. However, you will notice how two amber lights remain illuminated, and that is because the main gear doors do not have any hydraulic power to retract, so they will remain in the fully open position. If the landing gear doors were to be left in this position, they would scrape along the runway on landing, causing damage. So we must ensure that the doors are at least partially retracted before we attempt to land. The way the doors will be retracted in the real aircraft is by means of a hand crank and a winch located in the floor of the cockpit entrance. In our simulation of the F-28, we've decided to include these winch controls on the aircraft page of the AFB, which automatically appear whenever an alternate landing gear extension has been performed. Each click of the hand crank button represents one full turn of the hand crank, so 10 clicks should see the doors retract as far as possible. You can also use the toggle tail wheel lock control assignment to operate the hand crank. It is not possible to retract the doors to their fully closed position with no hydraulic power, so the normal procedure is to close the doors enough so that the amber door lights extinguish on the main instrument panel, which indicates that the landing gear doors are closed sufficiently that they will not impact the ground upon landing. When the aircraft is on the ground with the engine shut down and no hydraulic pressure, you can engage the gust lock to lock the controls in the neutral position to prevent the wind moving the control surfaces and causing damage. As a fail-safe measure to ensure the aircraft doesn't take off with the gust lock engaged, the gust lock also applies a lock to the throttles to prevent them from being advanced past 80% of their range. and therefore it would not be possible for the engines to achieve sufficient thrust for takeoff. This lock makes engine runs difficult for engineers on the ground as they aren't able to fully advance the throttles to perform a full power engine run of the engines. However, a switch on the right side of the pedestal, labelled number 1 and number 2, can be used to remove this lock on one engine at a time. With the gust lock engaged, moving this switch to the number 1 position will remove the lock from the left hand engine and it will allow the left hand engine to run at maximum engine power. As the lock on the right hand throttle is still in place in this situation, it is still only possible to advance the right throttle to 80% of its range. Whilst we're on the pedestal, it's hard to miss the plethora of light controls dotted across the panel. But in addition to these, there are many more light controls located around the cockpit and cabin that may not be quite as obvious. By my count, there are 35 different switches or controls in the cockpit and cabin to control the various exterior and interior lighting. And there is a good chance I may have missed one or two. <laughs> The lights across this panel are pretty self-explanatory, primarily focused on the exterior aircraft lights, but you can also control the red dome and white storm lights from here too. The storm light can be controlled using a button on the right side of the light, or by using the pedestal light control assignment. Moving down the overhead panel, you have a red reading light, two adjustable white reading lights, two panel instrument rotary light switches, and an emergency light switch for the cabin emergency lighting. On each of the cockpit side panels, you have red side panel lighting switches,
and white flood lighting switches for the main instrument panel. Across the bottom of the instrument panel, we have red instrument panel floodlights. Instrument lights. Engine instrument lights. And right hand side panel lighting on the first officer's side. On top of all this, you also have various bright dim switches throughout the cockpit that vary the brightness of various indicators. And the caution lights on the overhead panel can also be dimmed when rotated. Once we have finished playing the F-28's version of Twister to locate the various cockpit lighting controls, we can move into the cabin to find the cabin crew panels. Reading lights for the cabin crew can be controlled using the switch above the cabin crew panel. The cabin lights can be turned on using the two main cabin light switches. Evacuation lights can be controlled using this guarded switch. And entranceway lights can be controlled using this three position switch, which also controls the integral stair lighting. At the bottom of the cabin crew panel we also have various circuit breakers for the cabin equipment. These circuit breakers are functional and when pulled they do trip their respective cabin equipment. We have previously spoken about the cabin crew panel in detail in our dedicated cabin crew panel video, but since that video was created we have added additional functionality to the cabin, as well as completely remodeling and retexturing the panel. On the EFB we have added an auto cabin crew option, which when enabled means the cabin crew will automatically turn on and off the cabin lights at various stages of the flight and turn on and off the cabin music. One additional feature we have recently added is some simulation for the cabin and toilet call lights. When the auto cabin crew option is enabled and the aircraft is in the air, passengers will now have the ability to call the cabin crew from their seats or from the toilet. When the cabin crew is called, the light will illuminate from the area that the call has originated from and the chime will be heard. Once the cabin crew has assisted the passenger, they will automatically reset the light. Moving across briefly to the starboard side of the galley, we see various lockers and galley equipment, as well as the service door. Unfortunately, no tea or coffee making facilities are available at this time, which isn't ideal for those early morning flights, but the buttons on this panel are animated and their lights do illuminate when pressed. Returning to the cockpit, we'll briefly cover the independent autopilot and flight director systems. As we explained in our F-28 tutorial flight videos, the flight director is a completely independent system from the autopilot and therefore you could have the autopilot in the heading mode but the flight director could be in VOR localizer mode providing direction to intercept an ILS or VOR beam. A couple of modes that we want to cover in this video is the glide slope auto and glide slope manual modes. With glide slope auto selected the flight directors will provide lateral guidance to intercept the localizer beam once within intercept range and it will only start to provide vertical guidance once the glide slope has been captured. With glide slope manual, the lateral guidance remains the same, but vertical guidance for the glide slope will begin immediately upon selection of the mode. So in this example, I am below the glide slope with glide slope auto selected and therefore the flight director bars are indicating for me to maintain altitude until I capture the glide slope. However, if I engage glide slope manual, the flight directors will immediately direct me to fly up and intercept the glide slope beam. One final feature we have included 
is the stopwatch. Pressing the button at the top right of the stopwatch will start the timer. Pressing it a second time will stop the timer. And pressing it a third time will reset the timer back to zero. If you notice the timer stops counting, that is because the stopwatch is a winded type and it will need to be wound up using the rotary knob at the bottom left of the stopwatch in order for it to start counting again. It's one of those little features that can go easily unnoticed, but once you add up all of these little features, we do feel like it makes for a much more complete and immersive product. I could continue talking about each of the systems in the F28, but it's probably best to leave this video here as we've already covered quite a lot of information in this video. Hopefully this video was interesting and maybe you'll learn something new about the F28 Professional that you didn't know before. Finally, a big thank you to everyone who has already purchased the F28 Professional. It's been great seeing all your screenshots of people enjoying the aircraft. If you haven't purchased the product already, the F28 Professional is now available for PC at JustFlight.com and other third party retailers and it is now also available for PC by the in-game marketplace.